This show is presented by the 323 Network. You can watch all your favorite 323 friends and shows on the 323 Network YouTube channel. Follow us on all social media platforms at 323read. And support us as we continue to grow at patreon.com slash 323read. That's 323-R-E-I-D. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 323. I am your host, Reed Murphy. I, I'm really happy for you. I'm going to let you finish. Who the fuck is that guy? Look at the show. I'm the company. Welcome to the fucking show. Fuck Scott. That's right, folks. Welcome, college football fans, to another exciting episode of College Shame Day, presented by the 323 Network. I am your host, Scott Elia. We've got a packed show for you today. Everything from conference title games and Heisman Watch, the current chaos mode that seems to be enacted in the college football playoff. But speaking of packed, we got a special guest here, someone who's never lacking, always packing, Reed Keeplin, always in the chamber, Murphy. How's it going, Reed? You know me, I'm always packing. That's all always. that matters, always packing. Listen, if Omar ever taught us everything, you always keep one in the chamber at all times. <laughs> Even on this 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 of uh, greatest of holiday weeks of Thanksgiving, um, we a little t- a little peek behind the curtain. We are actually recording this during the day again. And if history wants to repeat itself, the last time we had a day recording, it went off the rails quick. So hopefully we can behave ourselves. Um, but first thing is that Reed, I don't know if you caught this, but JMU is no longer pursuing legal action against the NCAA for their bowl eligibility. What happened there? Uh, well, first off, they, they lost to Appalachian state 26 to 23 on Saturday in overtime, ending its perfect season. And the school later on cited, you know, that loss changed the landscape in terms of the nature and timing of their legal options, including the diminished viability of a lawsuit against the NCAA, that quote coming from the school itself. Uh, Later went on saying on Saturday evening, following the game, we consulted with Attorney General Mayeris and his staff, as well as with our outside counsel. And the consensus was that filing emergency legal action against the NCAA was not a viable course of action at this point in time. Furthermore, the school went to say, went to say the university's focus now is on getting the football team into a bowl game and it appears that such a result is still a strong possibility we could file still file an action against the ncaa later later if needed to receive a bowl invitation but for the time being there were a strong consensus that the proceedings with legal action did not make sense um so yeah i mean they still can make a bowl game um if there's enough slots available because there's 82 slots for these bowl games entering the final week of the regular season, 70 teams, including James Madison and also Jacksonville state. Who's kind of in the same boat. Um, being in the second FBS season, have at least six wins, but there's another 24 teams that have five wins and could become bowl eligible with the victory this weekend. Uh, do you think a, the NCAA was right for their, their kind of call or B, do you think James, James Madison, even with that loss to Appalachian State, still should have filed something. I mean, I probably still would have filed something. I understand I understand them pulling out, but still, just for the morale of the school and the students there and the fans, I mean, you could see during college game day on Saturday when uh, Pat McAfee was riling up all the student section and everything about, you know, screw the NCAA for all of this. They want, you know, just to keep morale, but... Then you get your ass kicked by App State. We're not, oh, I mean, you know, you lose to App State. You you don't want to lose to App State when you're the (laughs) undefeated JMU with college game day there. All morale is already dead. So then you tuck your tail between your legs and run away from the lawsuit. Yeah, and it kind of makes sense because I feel like if if they played somebody else and lost, 
of a better stature than an app state i feel like they still they still could have gotten away with some kind of litigation but it, with it being app state even though that institution does have a, a rich history of playing spoiler to a lot of these big time schools um i think that's what's kind of that last nail in the coffin they can't go before any kind of judge or at the ncaa at this point and say we deserve to be there because they'll be like well you just lost appalachian state how what do you think how, how do you think you're going to fare against a real fbs team at this point you guys have only been here for two years right. kind of thing so but oh well more to come there if if this ncaa season has taught us anything that these stories don't seem to die quickly so i'm sure there'll be some kind of update next week but moving on we kick things off with a breakdown of the upcoming conference title games yes we do have a slate of games this weekend that we'll talk about a little bit more in length but the conference title games seem to be all kind of set in stone. You know, Florida State is going to be playing Louisville and Charlotte. You got Alabama and Georgia playing each other for the SEC title game. Uh, the winner of the big Michigan-Ohio State game this week is going to be facing off against Iowa for the Big Ten championship. There's still some things to be ironed out in the Pac-12 as well. Washington's going to face off against either Oregon or Arizona, who ends up kind of edging each other out there. But there's a lot of moving pieces right now to the big 12 read i don't know if you notice this but it all comes down to the texas texas tech game if texas wins texas is in so there's there's one way texas can get in for the title moving on from there who are they going to face off against if they win and if oklahoma state beats byu then they play texas if oklahoma beats tcu with a Texas win and Oklahoma State loses, then Oklahoma plays Texas for a rematch of their Red River rivalry game where Oklahoma edged out Texas in the regular season. But if Kansas State beats Iowa State, Texas wins, and Oklahoma and Oklahoma State both lose, then Kansas State plays Texas. It's pretty cut and dry from there. You know, win and get in kind of thing. Do your, do your part, win to give yourself the best chance to get into that game. But this is where things kind of get off the rails because if Texas loses, they can still clinch if two out of those three teams that we just mentioned between Kansas State, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State, they still play the team who won. But if two or more of those teams win, all hell breaks loose. Since there would be three or four teams who are all tied for a championship berth, the, I try to go down the rabbit hole and there's so many moving pieces to this to try to figure out how to break this three to four team tie. Who the fuck knows what's going to happen? I say <laughs> just have two games going on at all times. Have like Kansas State and Oklahoma State playing each other and Oklahoma and Texas playing each other, but having the fields like intersect. So that way you kind of have to run into each other at the same time. Or have some kind of full all-out brawl. I don't know how the Big 12 is going to figure this out. Everything with realignment. I mean, we talked about this last year. Just the realignment process, moving everybody around. It's not only a mess, but then it's kind of sad in a, to a degree. Like, this is rivalry week that we have coming up. and Big games. Big games, but then, like, so many classic rivalries. Like, we've already had... Uh, you know, like Oklahoma OSU for the final time that, you know, whatever, I forgot what the name of that is that uh, rivalry game, but there's so many things that are getting lost so much tradition that's getting lost with realignment and everything. But you said all out brawl and I'm just all I'm for that. I'm for that. Anytime all out brawl, get the student section out there too. Like, you know how they rush the field, have them rush out there. Like it's a gladiator match. God. It's Avengers Endgame just between, you know, whatever fucking schools, Florida and Florida State. Right. And to to teach you something, it's called Bedlam, refers to the Oklahoma State in-state rivalry with that's, Oklahoma. That's the name. So the Bedlam series. But no, I'm right there with you. There's, I think this is one of the thing, like one of the pieces that you mentioned that you're going to lose with the realignment is these quintessential longtime his historical kind of rivalry games and matchups that we're going to miss at this point what's the point of even having conferences what's at, the point at this point no i don't i don't understand it either especially when once once they moved to the playoff system i started to just wonder like what the hell is even the point of it right well and and, and that's something that we kind of touched upon about you know earlier on in the season when we were talking about conference realignment when a lot of these teams started 
announcing where they're going to end up going. And then we talked about a little bit with the college football playoff not expanding next year, and they're sticking with the four-team kind of layout for right now. But, you know, outside of small, smaller sports, and I say smaller because, I mean, there's nothing that's going to rival the magnitude of college football for a school. I mean, I guess basketball can do it in certain markets, but – we're talking a national kind of impact. College football is the biggest thing. So it makes sense to having these conferences for like kind of the smaller, not so much impactful sports, but and been opening it up to, for having every football team being independent and just figuring it out from there. No, I, so I mean, this weekend, that. this weekend alone, I mean, you have the number two and number three team playing each other for not just not even a national championship berth in a playoff thing, but it's it's just for the Big Ten championship. Right. So who knows? Ooh. And that's not even where the madness starts because this is the thing that's been all over Facebook, all over Instagram, TikTok, ESPN, all the national pundits. They've all been talking about this nightmare scenario that's going to be facing that could potentially happen for the college football playoff. To kind of get everybody up to speed, the most recent poll for the college football playoff has Georgia 1, Ohio State 2, Michigan 3, and Washington jumping my Florida State Seminoles to 4, which kind of makes sense. I mean, outside of the Jordan Travis injury, which we'll kind of I'll touch on here in a second, um, if you look at just the resume between Washington and Florida State, they do have on paper a better resume in the long run, so it makes sense for them being there at 4 especially because Ohio State and Michigan, one of them is going to lose and get bumped out anyway. So Florida State, just win. That's all you got to do. Just just win. You'll be in there eventually. But that's not where the this situation gets worse because the scenario is who were the four teams in if between Ohio State and Michigan, they're the 13-0 Big Ten champion. Florida State wins out. They're 13-0. Oregon beats Washington in their championship game for them to be tied 12 and one. So that means the one loss that Oregon had was against Washington in the regular season. And then the one loss that Washington now has was against Oregon in the championship game. So you kind of figure, okay, what's the more impactful loss at that point. And further from there, you have a 12 and one Texas team who's who wins the big 12, their one loss coming against Oklahoma and beating Alabama in the regular season. And speaking about Alabama, what happens if they beat Georgia in their championship game to where their one loss against Texas at home in the regular season, and then Georgia's one loss against Alabama in the championship game? For me, I mean, it, it's pretty cut and dry. I don't understand why there's so much debate over this, but clearly to me, it's whoever the Big, the Big Ten champion is, whether it's Michigan or Ohio State, that's clear as day. They're in there. But then for me, I would also have Florida State in there. I'd have Oregon in there and I would have Texas in there because in in my criteria, if you're undefeated and you're a conference championship, that trumps everything. If you're the champion of a power five conference, regardless if it's the ACC or the SEC, even though there's clear bias between the two, it doesn't matter. You're automatically in. And then from there, I feel like, especially with the Oregon and the Washington split, I feel like it would have to edge it out to Oregon because they won the championship. So a championship trumps at that point. And then breaking it further down, then that's when you kind of get, okay, well, how do you decide between Texas and Alabama? Because they, you know, they're both one loss teams and they're both champions of their respective conferences, but Texas beat Bam in the regular season. So in my eyes, Reed, I don't know. I mean, I'll ask you in a second who you think your four would be at this point. I know we kind of rattled off pretty quick, but for me, Two, if these, if there's two outcomes, it clearly shows that the regular season doesn't matter at all. If Florida State doesn't get in at all, then obviously the regular season doesn't matter. And then if Alabama gets in over Texas, that is what clearly shows you that the regular season doesn't matter at all to these college football playoff committee folks who are picking these games. And you can't have that because if you clearly show bias against the regular season, then what's the point of even watching the regular season? You might as well just play four warm-up games and just make some massive 64-team March Madness-style playoff from here on out, and that's all you do. And, I mean, it, honestly, that's where I could see it going, right? And I think <laughs> like, at this, and it, as much money comes out of March Madness, like, imagine what the hell would happen with college football. 
and at the rate that it's going and the expansion that we're getting to with the playoff, why not? Right. And that's the thing. It's like, are you just going to have some massive, like, double elimination tournament throughout the season? Like, I'm sure they'll figure out some kind of way. But at this point, if you, if the, if not even so much Florida State doesn't get in, because that's going to show clear SEC bias if they have two SEC teams going in with, with Georgia and Alabama, because that's what they want to happen for ratings. But if Texas doesn't get in and they put Alabama in, that's to me, that clearly shows the regular season doesn't matter. So you might as well just make it a big, 10 to 12 week playoff and just have a battle it out. It would elim- do that. It would eliminate the argument. And I think it does bring, it would ease up that whole situation because I think there are arguments. You look at that, that pretty much that top eight, even down to Missouri at nine with Mizzou. Like you have well, arg- you got Louisville there yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, Louisville they got 10. That. Yeah. You have arguments for everybody to you know that there that there could be competition in there fsu dropping to five i think that's something that we talked about on the sunday hangover briefly was the idea that washington could you know then jump them because of the jordan travis injury there and it kind of taking them out but i think there's an argument there too with how their defense stepped up how that team played Mm -hmm. in that game after the injury and if uh rodemaker can you know just game manage and continue you know, continue the run there would not be a case against them to still you know argue that they can't win the championship teams have done it before losing their top quarterback oh yeah absolutely i mean i think the biggest thing and that's why i don't want to hear the florida state can't go because of the jordan travis injury it's a, it's a piss poor excuse in my book because if you look back at the 2014 ohio state buckeyes who won the national championship they had the same situation See, Braxton Miller got hurt yep. in the before the regular season. He fucked up his shoulder. And then you had redshirt freshman JT Barrett, who led the Buckeyes throughout the whole regular season, broke his ankle in that regular season finale. So who steps up? Third stringer, redshirt sophomore Cardell Jones, leads the Buckeyes to a Big Ten championship and then yep. later on to a national championship. So what, what, where was the scrutiny against that Ohio State team? Exactly. I don't remember hearing anything. So yep. why now? So I just it, it, it's a it's a very, very messy situation, especially especially the game last week. I mean, yes, Florida State eventually came back and crushed North Alabama 58 to 13 after being completely laying a goose egg that first quarter and having North Alabama go up 13 to zero. But I mean, if if that didn't happen and you saw the score 58 to 13, nobody nobody would be surprised. But you get, I've been seeing so much hate against Florida State because they were down 13 to zero. But I mean, you put that into comparison to a team like Alabama who played Chattanooga and they won 66 to 10. And I don't hear any kind of negative remarks about them being well, able to put up 10. And also, like, that's just a shit argument, too. Where, I mean, you look at Georgia, Georgia Georgia's good to spot you seven points every game. At the Mm -hmm. start, like Tennessee, you know, you know, Vols fans were thinking at the start of the game, we're going to be the ones to do it. We're going to do it. We're up seven, nothing. Oh, damn it. It's just what happens. It happens in (laughs) games. It's how you finish games. FSU, it really impressed me how they took over that game after the injury there. And even I'm just I'm hoping for Georgia to beat Alabama this weekend. I don't want the madness of that because I I don't. I don't believe Alabama deserves to make it into the playoff over – I don't believe they make deserve to make it in over Georgia if they beat them. I don't believe they deserve to make it over Ohio State or Michigan. I don't think – honestly, I don't believe they deserve to make it in over Washington or FSU Mm-mm. really at this rate unless FSU really shits the bed against Florida and really right. looks mightily unimpressive, then, you know, go ahead, get rid of them. It's not going to work. But then you got Oregon with Bo Nix. After that, yeah, I really think Alabama is – I think Alabama is probably at best the seventh-ranked team in the nation. Right. So. right. And um, it's actually funny that you say that because it, I don't think it is a, a worse time to transition 
into the shameful eight and kind of talk about where I have Alabama at this point, because you say you have them in what at seven. I have Alabama at seven, six best, six at best. If FSU is really bad off, I have them at eight. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have them at eight. I mean, yes, they they had light work against Chattanooga, sixty-six to ten. They got the Iron Bowl coming up this weekend against Auburn. They're on the road. And then they face off against number one Georgia in the SEC championship after that. But I don't know. I just, there's something about this Alabama team that I'm just not totally sold on this year. I can't put my finger on it. I mean, yes, they only have that one loss to Texas at home. But they just, they're just, it's kind of like how we talked about recently on the Sunday hangover and Ricks versus Ricks, the NFL kind of side to everything where, I felt like the Dallas Cowboys are kind of sneaking under the radar. I think yeah. this is a perfect kind of comparison with Alabama right now. It's just sneaking in. I, I think so. And even even with how impressive their quarterback is with Jalen Milrow, he's he's been he's improved mightily from the start of the season. So, I mean, they're very impressive on that. And I think that honestly, they'll probably be back to that glory next year. I think that they can build it back up off of the success that they've had under the radar here now, but. At this right. point, they're they're not they're not a top five to top four team, right? Well, it's like, and especially for me, the reason why I have them at eight is because I really do believe, regardless of where the game happened in the season, that's where a lot of these national pundits and other college football shows kind of like to point out is that that loss to Texas happened so early, and it's you know who knows what would have happened if they played that game again now, but. I'm really, I, I will hold firm on tiebreakers and a win is a win no matter where it happened. And that's why I have Texas in there at seven. You know, they have that, they own that tiebreaker over Alabama. Last week they beat Ohio's, uh, Ohio, Iowa State by 26 16. Like I said, they have that Texas Tech game at home this week, which all they got to do is win, just focus on that to lock that Big 12 championship. Yeah. And then also, Yes. I, well, I'll let you finish on that. I didn't mean to interrupt on it, but with Texas, like I'm curious with Quinn Ewers and his performance this season. I think at the beginning of the year, we were talking about him possibly being like a top, you know, he could be one of the top draft picks this mm -hmm. season coming out of Texas. Do you think that's still the case? Has things gone down a little bit, especially since the Red River rivalry? Well, and I think especially now, because Quinn, Quinn Rivers, Quinn Ewers, announced that he will be returning to Texas for another season next that year. News. And I think that's the best thing for him to do because if he were to come out for the draft right now, he would be a mid third to fourth round pick. Yeah. Like it's just, yes, he was very impressive when he was playing, but I think the injury um, to his AC joint, I think he got, I think it was a grade two AC joint sprain. I think that's what's kind of messing him up. And who knows if he's going to even return next season the same way but i think for texas this is more plays into the whole arch manning kind of storyline like what's what's arch manning gonna do do you think he's gonna sit there behind him another year or could you see him transferring to like a usc and play with lincoln riley and get that damn near sherlock of a heisman trophy or with Jaden daniels looking like he's gonna be moving on from lsu and how deep the mannings are there in louisiana could he eventually just transfer to LSU. That's what I want to look at right now in Texas. Oh, I would I would doubt with how that family operates, how they've operated with, I mean, Eli's the best example. I doubt that Arch is going to stay there for another year. I'm sure they're, the whole family's probably viewing his development as ready to go sophomore year. Let's go ahead, transfer. USC would be, that would be a hell of a choice. Mm -hmm. That would be a hell of a choice for him to go there, and he would be a pure star on that right. team. classic USC quarterback. But LSU, I could see that happening as well. If James right. Daniels does move on and Brian Kelly's, you know, a good enough coach that I think Arch could elevate him. Right. And I mean, I think all signs would have pointed to a, a potential transfer to Ole Miss where, you know, the family has really deep ties into that alma mater. But I think with Jackson Dart returning for another season next year, that kind of takes it out the book. So you kind of have to look around the league and see where the best fit is for him. And Honestly, I don't think the best fit for him right now is Texas. Because <laughs> not only just Quinn Ewers, but that's a very stacked QB room. And in the nature of the game right now, like you have to be open to transfer around. I mean, you saw that with Jordan Travis. He transferred from Louisville to Florida State and kind of propelled his career into what it is now and worked himself into a 
potentially for me kind of a ceiling of a third round pick especially now with that that ankle foot lower leg injury but um i'm interested to see there and another thing that i'm interested to see is the sixth team that i have in the shameful eight and that is oregon and bo nicks who we'll talk about here a little bit more deeper in a second but oregon they completely destroyed the arizona state sun devils on the road 49 to 13. they have number 11 oregon state at home this week maybe a pac-12 championship who knows like i said it comes down to them in arizona right now so it's kind of sketchy going up against that oregon state team who could play spoiler to the ducks thankfully they're at home <laughs> But I'm interested to see what Bo Nix is going to be able to do with his performance last week. Moving on to number five, we kind of talked about this. And I'm pretty sure folks at home listening can kind of figure out the top five from here. But we have Florida State who handled out North Alabama 58-13. to They're on the road this week against Florida and then against number 10 Louisville in the ACC Championship. The name in the game right now is just win to further cement yourself into that college football playoff conversation. Same thing for Washington at number four. Last week, they beat that number 11 Oregon State team 22-20 to on the road, which I was surprised about. They were able to get away with that victory. I don't know if you caught any of that game last week, Reed. I did. I did. That was impressive. Yeah, Michael Penix, he kind of had a relatively mediocre game. So, yeah. thankfully, they were able to just kind of keep it tight and get that win. It was. It was. And, I mean, the weather was awful. The weather was god-awful in that game. Right. And, I mean, Oregon State deep. What's his name? Oh, man. it was a, It's a fight with DJ in that last name. DJ. I had it the other night. Don't ask I me. swear I had it the other night. I'm not seasoned enough to be able to pronounce that last <laughs> name. I know my strengths. But, but no, I think, you know, this. it's good that they're at home this week against Washington State, you know, and then they're going to be facing off either against Oregon or Arizona in that championship game. But I think that this is a perfect moment for them to kind of right the ship a little bit iron out some of those kinks that they might have faced last week but hopefully they don't get caught looking a week ahead and they get upset by washington state at home because that just would be detrimental to michael Penix jr's heisman candidacy right now we don't need that uh going into number three um i have the ohio state buckeyes they crushed minnesota at home last week 37 to 3. Like we mentioned, they do have Michigan on the road this week. The winner goes to the Big Ten Championship. Nothing really of nothing really of note there. Number two is where I had the Georgia Bulldogs, who handled the number 18 team, Tennessee, 31 to 10 on the road there in Tennessee. They got Georgia Tech in another, I guess, rivalry game, in-state rivalry game. I guess if you want to kind of put it like that, I would never really link those two together as true rivals, but hey, it is what it is. But that's another team that I don't see them getting caught looking with their pants down, looking ahead to another week against Alabama and SEC championship. I think they're going to come out and handle Georgia Tech pretty easily, resting a lot of their starters in that second half, which gets us to the number one team in my eyes, which is the Michigan Wolverines. Even though, yes, they did squeak out a win over Maryland, 31 to 24. Reed, that's another game I don't know if you watch. I was on the edge of my seat that whole time watching that game. I missed that one. What were the highlights of that one for you? Uh, baby Tua put up 247, <laughs> but he had two picks. Uh, Blake Corum had a, a really solid outing, you know, 28 carries, 94 yards and two touchdowns. But, um, thankfully Maryland has, they've already kind of clinched a bowl berth this year. I think that's one team to really look out for in the future in the big 10. They've been very competitive in all their losses. How do you feel I mean, about baby Tua? He, I don't see him ever getting drafted. That's the thing. Yeah. Even with his name, I don't see him getting drafted at all. He'll probably be an undrafted free agent. Um, Could work himself into a, a career backup role, but I don't know. I just don't see it like I do with Tua. And for those at home who don't know who we're referring to, we're talking about Tua Tungabaloya. And I am impressed I got that close Look with his last name. Look at you. His younger brother, Talia. Like he plays with the Maryland Terrapins, who are currently uh, six and five on the season. They've dropped, they've dropped five of the last six. <laughs> Sadly enough, but I don't know. I think the best thing for Talia to do right now is to 
try to develop the best he can. I mean, he's a senior. Hopefully he has a good showing in his pro days and potentially if he gets a combine invite, but I don't see it the same way I do with Tua. Yeah. Nah. We root for I don't for know about him. you. He'll, he'll get one of those, uh, you know, family tryouts like all of Giannis Antetokounmpo's brothers do with the Milwaukee Bucks. Yeah, hey, I know the Patriots are looking to try, potentially move on from a quarterback. Could you imagine the the animosity in the house if you have Tua with the Dolphins <laughs> and you have Talia playing for the Patriots? I would not <laughs> want that uh, that conversation with their father, knowing them, knowing his <laughs> reputation. Oh no, not at all, not at all. But we kind of touched off on it a little bit ago, and that was Bo Nix. Um, he had a monster game, an absolute monster game against the Arizona State Sun Devils. 24 for 29, 404 yards, six touchdowns. Year to date, he's 78% completion percentage. 3,500 yards, 34 touchdowns, 35 touchdowns. Sorry, Bo, almost took one from you. And only two picks. And that is why it is still Bo time. And that is why he's still number one in my Heisman watch candidacy right now. Following up from him, Michael Penix Jr. Again, just like last week, there's really a big no change read for the Heisman watch for me. I mean, last week, 13 for 28, 162 and two touchdowns against that Beaver team. Still very solid year to date. Stats, 66.5 completion percentage, 3,600 yards, 30 touchdowns, and seven interceptions. And I I think I only have him at two because of how well Washington's been performing this year. If LSU had more wins under the belt, I think I would have Jaden Daniels there at two because he's been having a stellar year. Last week against Georgia State, think, I mean, granted, it's Georgia State. Reed, I don't know if you any, know anybody from Georgia State or who played for them. I'm no, sure you'll find I, out for me in a little bit. I got But you. last week, 25 for 30, 400 yards, six touchdowns. That's right, six touchdowns against that Georgia State team, which puts him on the year 72.6 completion percentage, 3,500 yards, 36 touchdowns, and four picks. Reed, really quick, we're going to pause. If the LSU Tigers were performing better overall, and by better, I mean more wins, he has to be the clear favorite, right, based off of that stat line. Oh, 100%, because I saw... And I, I'm looking for it now, but there was another stat that showed in terms of like, I think total touchdowns scored or something of the like this season. And it was various combinations, you know, from different schools of quarterback to this receiver or these receivers all together. And then like tied for number one was just Jaden Daniels himself just by himself yeah well that's the thing because like the stats that i usually spit out at this point it's just it's just passing it's just the passing game his his legs will kill you he's over a thousand yards rushing 10 touchdowns i mean he's equate he's been responsible for 46 total touchdowns this year yes which i mean looking back in history that rivals cam newton when he was at auburn with his heisman so i think with just how well my, uh, with Michael Penix Jr. and the Washington Huskies and Bo Nix with the Oregon Ducks, how, how well the team's doing overall. I think that's the only thing that's edging out Jaden Daniels and that LSU team. I mean, the only losses they have were against <clears throat> Florida State Seminoles week one. Ooh. Ole Miss on the road and Alabama on the road. All three of those were away games. I mean, technically, yes, they were the home team of course, Florida State, but they played in Orlando. Right. I don't really consider that being a home team, but I think if they were if they were able to to get that victory on the road in Alabama, I think that that victory alone would propel Jane Daniels to number one in my book. Even with being a two loss LSU team, that game would have propelled him drastically up. I but agree. Nope. I digress. Moving on, talking about touchdowns, Marvin Harrison Jr. I do have it for. Even though last week was kind of meh, three receptions for 30 yards, but he did get a touchdown against the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Year to date, 62 receptions for 1,000 yards and 13 touchdowns. That should translate to the NFL, right? When he comes out? I think he will. Yeah, 100%. I think I mean, he'll, be, with, he'll be an impact player pretty immediately. Right. I mean, especially with how much the NFL landscape has changed as far as their offensive schemes and throwing the ball a lot more. I mean, I 
I think right now he's kind of projected to go to the Bears, but could you see him even being successful on the Bears team with all their problems? I think that he still could. I think he's that kind of a player that he's going to pre, uh, provide that pretty immediate impact and that right. uh, pretty immediate relief for a team that especially like them could use it. And if he's paired with a, another receiver who is, I still believe, a clear-cut number one but has number two tendencies too, or he's just like a perfect pair, which is DJ Moore, that Bears Ooh. wide receiver. If you pair Marvin Harrison Jr. up with him and potentially since they would – could have two top five picks get Brock Bowers from Georgia in there too. Mm -hmm. Scary. Well, and speak about Georgia, we did have Brock Bowers on the Heisman watch list last week at the five spot, but I swapped him out this week, Reed. Oh. For who? I swapped him, I swapped him out for Carson Beck, the quarterback oh. there in Georgia. He has had a sneakily solid season, and I think you can you can probably chalk that up more to being because he's playing for the Georgia Bulldogs, but last week he was 24 for 30 for just barely under 300 yards passing and three touchdowns against a Tennessee volunteer team, which I was wrong. I will eat the crow now. I was wrong. They did not play spoiler to the Georgia team this season, but on the year, 72.9% completion, 3,300 yards, 21 touchdowns and five picks. I think the only thing that's kind of knocking him right now is that touchdown total. But I mean, what more do you want from him? And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I have not really thought too much about the quarterback this year, especially like I'm just you. My natural instinct is that Stetson Bennett is still there. So, <laughs> Where is good. Stetson Bennett? Has he resurfaced after he just met, just randomly left the Rams? I don't know. He's been, he's Has been, anyone seen him? He's a perplexing one. I'm sure, I'm sure based on the reputation, it seems like somebody might be looking for him. Oh, boy. Well, oh, well. But, yes, that is the Heisman watch list. We got Bo Nix coming in at one, followed by Michael Penix Jr., Jane Daniels, Marvin Harrison Jr., and Carson Beck. We got some really big games between now and the big night of the Heisman Trophy ceremony. So there's still a lot of movement that could happen. Uh, speaking about movement, that's not going to be happening, and that's Jordan Travis's left leg. <laughs> Poor guy. Yikes. Uh, that... I feel like I feel partially responsible for this injury happening because that was college shame day's game of the week last week of the number four Florida state Seminoles over North Alabama, which they did win 58 to 13. So, but I feel like I jinxed them. I thought about that as soon as it happened and you called it the game of the week. And I was just thinking, I was like, you know what? If it wasn't everybody else's, I was like, it just became the national game of the week. <laughs> it's like, it's not the way that you wanted it to become that, but it's it's how it happened. Right. Well, it's like, and I feel like, especially in this form of media, where you're covering a very volatile and at sometimes toxic environment that is college football, I try to be as unbiased as I possibly can. Yes, I do release a little bit of venting here and there when it comes to the Florida State Seminoles, but I feel like I've done a decent job this this season so far not yeah. showing total bias but this week i just i had to give it to him you know it was his last game at doak they had a 2013 national championship team there to kind of honor Jameis winston's retiring of his number five jersey so congratulations again to Jameis winston but you know north alabama they led florida state 13 to 0 before that jordan travis injury to his left leg he's now out for the reigner of the season so thoughts and prayers out to him and the whole jordan travis camp hopefully he heals relatively quickly try to recoup some kind of draft stock in the offseason oh, who knows but they they did what they needed to do they rallied behind that number 13 they they scored 50 unanswered points after the injury backup tate rodemaker was 13 for 23 for 217 yards and two touchdowns and they're looking to rally right now they have two really big games left on the slate so that way they can still buy for that college football playoff spot you know they got Florida, they got to play Florida on the road, who is also without their starting quarterback, Graham Mertz, with a collarbone injury. And then even after that, they got to play Louisville in the ACC, ACC championship. Um, me, as unbiased as I want to try to be, I am very confident in Tate Rodemaker. But, hey, it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, he's somebody that's been there for a minute, right? Yeah. Um, I think on the... As it stands right now for him specifically, 
Um, I believe he's played in a total of eight games. He's has like five touchdown passes, no interceptions, but he has been there the whole time that um, head coach Mike Norvell's been there. He's the heir apparent because Jordan Travis was going to be returning after the season anyways, being that registered uh, senior. Um, I think with how much Mike Norvell likes to lean on the transfer portal, that he probably would come out trying to find somebody, but he's a junior. He's a local kid. He's from Valdosta, Georgia, which is probably eh, 45 minutes, an hour away from Tallahassee. Grew up a long time Knowles fan. So like I said, on the year so far, he's posted a 64% completion percentage, 300 yards, five touchdowns, no picks. Can't ask more for a backup. Oh, uh -oh. like I said, if Cardell Jones can do it, why can't he? As long as, uh, you know, as long as you can just game manage. You never like right. to be called a game manager. But if you can just manage the game fairly and minimize your turnovers, minimize any mistakes, lean on the strengths of the rest of that team. I mean, you have two of the best wide receivers in the nation right there. Yep. You can figure out things to just get along and get where you need to go. And I feel that is what is more important to focus on. Is it detrimental to the team that Jordan Travis isn't playing? Absolutely. He's been a leader and a game manager, like you said, and he's been a big part of that Florida State team for years now and really bringing them back to relevancy in the college football world. But like you said, with the amount of weapons that they have, not only on defense and how stacked they are when they can just trade people in and out all the time, but, I mean, that offense in Keon Coleman and Jaheim Bell at tight end and Kyle Morlock, who's kind of at tight end, who's had a sneaky good season so far. And then big body Johnny Wilson. I mean, you have them, and then you have just like – it's almost like a four-headed monster at this point in the backfield with their running backs. I mean, you have so many weapons around you and a really stout offensive line. All you got to do is just – Follow the game plan, trust in your abilities, trust in those around you. And I feel like everything will just kind of fall into place, to be perfectly honest, for the Seminoles team. That's the optimism you like to have. That's the, that's what we have to have. And speaking about optimism, hopefully Michigan's optimistic still without Jim Harbaugh, who is serving his last week of his suspension stemming from the cheating scandal. And for those of you, I know this is an auto, audio medium. If you couldn't hear the air quotes, I did put air quotes around the cheating scandal. Um, just to kind of preface the game, this is College Shame Day's game of the week. I think it's the game of the week for College Game Day. There's a real, there's a great slate of games we'll get into kind of quickly later on since it is rivalry week. But this is the biggest game of the year. You got number two Ohio State on the road against number three Michigan. The winner moves on to the Big Ten Championship versus number 16 Iowa. And more than likely the college football playoff if they beat Iowa which I don't think they'll have a problem because Iowa doesn't like scoring points for whatever reason I don't think they got the memo that's part of the game but hey it is what it is I think the key for Michigan is you know really relying on Blake Corum so far on the year he has 180 carries for 888 yards and 20 touchdowns as sad as it is to say in the NFL with how irrelevant it seems that running backs have gotten I'm gonna be sad to see him leave and go to the NFL. I mean, you wish the best of luck to him to go in the NFL and having it translate, but I just don't see any running backs translating ever again in the NFL. Not, not at the level that they used to, not at the immediate impact level that you used to be able to get, especially, I mean, hell, just, a, well, I guess it's a decade now, but with Todd Gurley, Ezekiel Elliott, Melvin Gordon, when those guys were coming right out. Right. I think of, as of late, the only running back that's kind of held up under these changes well actually two well not so much now because he's kind of on the the twilight years of his career but derrick henry and then nick chubb i honestly oh. think b john robinson could if it were he could the if coaching. they had a competent head coach yeah <laughs> who didn't actively want to lose yeah <laughs> just get him just help his migraines out get him some excedrin make sure he's hydrated and just help him out a little bit the migraines probably coming from the damn coach absolutely and talk about migraines i mean the key for ohio state is the dynamic duo between quarterback kyle mccord who has thrown for 66 percent completion percentage just barely under 3,000 yards 22 touchdowns and four picks 13 of those touchdowns going to somebody we just talked about marvin harrison jr who's 
I think at, as it stands right now, 62 receptions and 1,093 yards. Damn. That's scary to go up against. Uh huh. And obviously, both defenses need to make very limited mistakes, but I feel this game is going to come down to whoever wins a turnover slash penalty battle. That's going to who is going to end up winning the game. I can see that. But, oh, and I don't know, Reed, if you missed it, but we did have TCU. They beat Baylor last week, 42 to 17. Hey, the Holy Bowl. Meh. And going into this week's lame of the week, we got Indiana at Purdue. Double meh. I would recommend it's Thanksgiving week this week, folks. Find something better to do. Family's in town. <laughs> go entertaining. Go Black Friday shopping. Got deals going on all weekend long. We got NFL games on at different times this weekend to go watch. Just don't watch this game. It's not worth it. But you know what is worth it, Reed? Not one of my betting slips. They haven't cashed out yet. Oof. But it is time for another week of the most exciting. Well, not even the most exciting. Because I would feel the most exciting thing that's hit the radio waves of the podcast world is the Calvin Ridley betting slip. Uh, and Reed, yeah. can you remind the folks where they can find the Calvin Ridley Memorial betting slip? Well, of course, they can find that on the flagship show, the 323 with Reed Murphy. You go to the 323 Network on YouTube. Subscribe there. You can always catch that. Or at 323 Reed. It's literally just 323 R-E-I-D. Social media, we try to get that out. But I'd like you to hear it on the show. You got to go with it live. The Calvin Ridley Memorial betting slip is fun as hell. Oh, yeah. And we we almost did good. We almost did good. We almost did. And I'm not going to tell you folks what we did, what happened. You're going to have to find that on that show. Yeah. Or follow the Instagram, follow the social medias. But uh, last week, we did, we did go three for five. Tennessee didn't win, sadly enough. But hey. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. But new week, new me, new money. We're going to hit this week. It's Thanksgiving. It has to happen. Has to. The gods have to re just have to renew the responsibility to me after that Jordan Jabs injury. But like we kind of tipped our hands at a little bit ago, there are some great games coming up this week. We got number 12 Ole Miss at Mississippi State. TCU at number 13 Oklahoma. Number 17 Iowa at Nebraska. Mm. Yeah. Meh. UTSA at number 23, Tulane. Number nine, Missouri at Arkansas. Texas Tech at number seven, Texas. Number 11, Penn State at Michigan State. Number 16, Oregon State at number six, Oregon. Number two, Ohio State at number three, Michigan. Kentucky facing off against the number 10 team, Louisville. Jimbo Fisher list, Texas A&M against number 14, LSU. Number eight, Alabama at Auburn. Number 15, Arizona at Arizona State. BYU at number 20, Oklahoma State. Vanderbilt playing number 21, Tennessee. First of all, how is Tennessee still even in the top 25? I don't know. <laughs> is it just because they forgot? Like, they're just like, nobody's actually paying attention. They're like, oh, Tennessee's probably, yeah, just throw them there somewhere in the late 20s. Yeah. It's, it, see, and I feel like that's probably what ended up happening. It's kind of like, uh, growing up and you go to like these holiday parties or Thanksgiving around massive amounts of family and you have all these underage kids sneaking the the adult punch in their cup <laughs> and Tennessee just happens to squeeze in there and get it <laughs> but hey I, congrats Tennessee you're still in there at 7 and 4 somehow uh, number 25 Liberty congratulations to Flames and to Jerry's kids they're facing UTEP on the road Washington State at number four, Washington. Number five, Florida State at Florida. Number 18, Notre Dame at Stanford. Number one, Georgia at Georgia Tech. And another seven and four team that happens to be still somehow relevant, the number 24 team, Clemson at South Carolina. How, how are they still getting away with this? How are that they? That doesn't make any sense either. Whatever. You keep getting away and with then, this. You can't keep getting away with this. And then to round it out, Iowa State at number 19, Kansas State, and North Carolina at number 22, NC State. Folks, that is why this weekend is probably the greatest weekend because it is a rivalry week. All these games have huge implications, whether it's championship bursts for your conference, potential playoffs bursts down the road, or hell, even just in-state bragging rights. But Reed is no time better than the great right now to the spin the wheel of Degenerate. Hey. Spin it five times. Let's trust the fates. We'll build a five-team parlay. 
For reminding folks at home, I will not tell you the winners of each game because I am just gonna build it off screen. And whoever I feel is gonna win, you'll have to find on the 323 College Shame Day Instagram page. First game we have up right now is at North Carolina at number 22 NC State. That should be an interesting game. I think I it, feel. Yeah, I think it should. I'm curious to see how Drake May responds from last week losing to a, uh, you know, Dabo Swinney on the Tyler Revenge Tour. Oh god. Tyler. I don't know. Tyler. Well, that NC State Wolfpack team has been surprisingly playing well this year and I'm glad for them, but oh well. Take them off the board, spin it again. Who we got coming up? on the second pick of the college shame day wheel degenerate betting slip oh there we go we've got the game for emily sissel the jimbo sweeney jimbo sweeney oh my god they're so alike i'm starting to merge your name but the jimbo fisherless texas a&m aggies against the brian kelly effect number 14 lsu tigers that is going to be a fun game. I'm going to tell you that right now. Texas A&M seems to have some kind of life backed in, injected into them since Jimbo's left. And Jane Daniels in that high-powered LSU offense, I am very excited. Oh, man. Number three. Oh, another kind of meh game. The number 15 Arizona Wildcats at Arizona State. I don't particularly yeah. care for the game but i guess in the sake of making money i guess we'll keep it <laughs> that's what makes games interesting that's the beauty of sports betting <laughs> i guess it would make more sense putting games that i don't have any kind of tie to at this point in here I feel less about fading myself Ooh, look at this byu at the number 20 oklahoma state and reed did you see that byu had their very first jewish starting quarterback that was quite an interesting thing to see i did not think about that i mean as somebody who went to a byu i went to byu idaho for a little bit i i know that there are plenty of non-mormons that go to the school <laughs> um i did not meet a jewish person at byu <laughs> uh but you know hey progress we're making yeah, progress there. congrats to to, to, to jake retzlaff Pardon me if I'm ruining, butchering your last name, but hey, representation matters, no matter what capacity. Yeah. Oh, uh, but let's move on to the last pick of the Wheel of Degenerate. Coming in at fifth pick. Oh, no. I played myself. Oh, look what you did. We just talked about how I don't want to have any kind of tie to any games, so that way I feel less bad about fading myself on any kind of picks. And what happens? I talk shit to the fates, and the fates talk right back. It's what the they fifth do. and final pick on this betting slip this week is the number five Florida State Seminoles at the Florida Gators. Reed, did I just play myself? Yeah, you played yourself. Damn it. God damn it. I'm excited. But just to remind everybody, you got the Texas A&M Aggies at 14 LSU, number 15 Arizona at Arizona State, BYU at number 20 Oklahoma State, North Carolina at number 22, NC State, and the number five team, Florida State Seminoles at the Florida Gators. Reed, I can't believe that just happened. I'm so upset. <laughs> uh, oh. But either way, folks, thank you for joining us for the latest installment of College Shame Days. And remember, and don't miss out on any of the excitements. Follow us, uh, follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 323CollegeShameDay and at 323Read for all NFL talk as well subscribe to 323 network on youtube and catch our podcast on all major podcast platforms maybe i'll change maybe i'll try a new one this week you like never I said I'm, I'm very i'm very loyal to spotify and the brand that they have going on over there but who knows what i'm gonna do this week there's a whole lot of things you can do you can hear and you can hear us do plenty of analysis like how we just we, look the things that we come up with this show's a little more serious but you go to, you know, Sunday hangovers and I'll be talking about how we could get Zach Wilson transferred to American Jewish University playing for Zion the Lion. Zion the Lion? Is that's, that real? That's their mascot at American Jewish University. We'll get a Mormon quarterback there. I don't know if they have oh, a football God. team. I did find Georgia State notable alumni for you, by the way. Okay, Just, I'm glad because I was about to say that that school sounds like some of the schools that Michigan's claiming wins over to get their thousand 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 is that a word am i saying can you say that word thousand thou thousand thou thousand why do i feel like i, it, I am i not saying this correctly thousand thousand there we go 
one zero zero zero. Isn't it going to be fun when we go to celebrate Michigan's thousandth win again in a few years after they get these wins vacated for cheating? They should vacate them. They're playing (laughs) high schools and deaf schools. But anyways, Georgia Georgia State alum, who do you got for me? We have Gucci Mane. We have yeah. We have have notable Sean Payton kicker Will Lutz played for uh, Georgia State. Uh, Rodney Hamilton, I recognize that name. Uh, not a whole bunch of people, but then it's really top heavy, actually, because then we get to uh, rap producer Mike Will made it, uh, Ludacris, and Julia Roberts. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if they're. I, it sounds like they're a big uh, media, multimedia, kind of driven school with. Definitely all seems those, like all it. those music artists. I thought it said ABBA, but it's actually Abra that also went there. The Pokemon? Sure. Sure. Oh, well. But that is it for today, folks. Um, It is Thanksgiving week, so make sure to spread thanks to those who are closest to you. Reed, I am thankful for you this year and the 323 Network for finally giving me an average white guy a platform to voice his opinions. Damn right. And I'm thankful for you, whites. There we go. Keep on and remember, watching. folks, if, if you're not going to be good, be good at it. Have a very shameful holiday. See you next time. I should have made a Mike Will made it to college joke. <laughs> well, damn you, Reed. <laughs> <laughs>